Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world you might be joining us from today. My name is Elena Stavrevska. Uh, I'm a feminist and peace studies scholar of and from the Balkans. Um, and I currently work at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm joining you today from London, um, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being the moderator of today's event. The event, very optimistically titled Feminist Responses to the Pandemic in the Western Balkans and Visions for a Post-COVID-19 Region, is the third and penultimate for now in a series of webinars organized by the British Council as part of, the, part of their Women in Science Resilience platform. Um, I think I have started every single one of these webinars with um, Nyla Kabir's, and not only hers, but um, fem other feminist scholars observation that the pandemic has had primarily a revelatory Lina, character. Sorry, we just hear the interpreter and you at the same time, and it's very problematic. Interpreter? Or your voice, I hear it twice, something strange is happening. Do the others hear me okay? Do you hear me double as well? Uh, yes. I hear you fine, Elena. Yes, you're okay, Elena. Could it be that, uh, Jenny, maybe try um, with uh, headphones? Sanya and Nella, are you hearing hear me double or? I think it's a, there is a delay when you start talking. You could... It's maybe. like somebody is letting a recording of you go on top of you speaking, so we hear double. Okay. Um, even do you think that like maybe is everyone muted? Now seems good. Okay, maybe someone yeah. was not muted. Uh, everyone was muted, Elena, and for me it was okay. Right, in, in, if you're joining from um, continental Europe, uh, well, part of continental Europe, 1 p.m. Um, I did obviously jinx this by saying that, that we don't have any technical issues so far in this webinar. But either way, I was welcoming you and uh, just uh, introducing myself. Um, in, in introducing today's webinar, um, I was saying that I think I have started probably each one of the webinars so far with um, one of the, the, the main issues that um, feminist scholars and activists from around the world have highlighted is that the COVID crisis has a primarily uh, revelatory character, and if anything, it all highlights already exist, highlights and deepens already existing um, inequalities. Now, to feminists in general and the feminists joining us today, um, this is nothing new. To the contrary, something that we've been, we've been talking about um, for decades, if not centuries. Um, so, um, in addition to the, to the so, so it's important to remember that the current pandemic and the management thereof through lockdowns and curfews um, has shown even more, not only the crisis of public health many countries around the world, um, including those in the Western Balkans are facing, as well as the crisis of neoliberal capitalism, but also, and relatedly I would say, uh, the existing, the sharp existing intersectional inequalities. And we'll talk about this more as we, um, as we engage with the speakers today. Um, so in a way around the world, the region not being an exception, the pandemic has kind of cracked open, pulled back the curtain further on existing, racialized, ethnicized, classed, gendered, sexualized and intersectional inequalities. Um, so these have been evident in every domain of life from the care sector of who works in the care sector, who, who for whom care is available. Um, then the assumption that in, in many of the societies around the world um, that the, the families, and this usually does mean women, um, can provide care in absence of child care and elderly care facilities being available to the overrepresentation of women on the front lines of the health sector um, to the economy where those working in the so-called informal economy have been hit the hardest and not included often not included uh, in the government's responses um, and therefore having to choose in a way between ensuring their livelihood or remaining safe to the assumption that everyone has a home and every home is a safe one um, and this has been an assumption both in the initial response, if, but in more recent response as well, even though we have seen a surge of domestic violence around the world and again in the region as well. 
Uh, we have already seen some first studies, well actually not even first, um, a wave of studies on the gendered and gendering impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, with many not only showing the grim current situation, but also some suggesting that this will significantly set back gender equality and equality in general for decades to come. Um, so with all this in mind, not optimistic at all. Today's webinar starts with a curiosity about what the situation has been like in the Western Balkans and how it connects to global trends. So um, I guess both the bad and the good news is that we are not an exception um, in relation to what's happening elsewhere in the world. Today, I have the distinct honor of being joined by three speakers who are incredible activists and researchers working in and on different, uh, different countries in the region. Um, we have speakers from uh, joining us today from Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia. Um, so let me introduce them one by one. Uh, Jenny Karaj is the executive director of Alianza LGBT, which is the Alliance Against Discrimination of LGBTI People uh, in Albania. Um, uh, Jenny holds a master's degree in psychology awarded by the University of Tehran. She has been working for five years as head of international relations at the National Audio and Visual Media Authority, which is an independent Albanian regulatory and watchdog public institution. She has been a tireless campaigner for gay rights and leader of the Albanian LGBT movement in, uh, in Albania. And in this capacity, she's one of the founders of Alianza LGBTI um, and Streha LGBTI, the first residential LGBTI shelter in all Eastern Europe. For several years, she has been one of the only public uh, spokesperson of LGBTI issues in Albania. In her work experience, she has gained a lot of knowledge um, on LGBTI and human rights issues, lobby and advocacy, training and capacity building for different groups of professionals, project management, design and implementation, uh, design and implement specific programs for volunteers, fundraising, public awareness and so on. Um, so Jenny clearly is an outstanding LGBTI activist, a well-respected regional figure in the field of human rights, and also the first ever Albanian lesbian to come out on television. She's viewed uh, from the LGBTI community in Albania and feminist groups as an encouragement and role model, while she's a real motivation and point of reference, especially for the lesbian community in Albania and Balkans. Thank you for joining us today, Jenny. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thank you. Uh, we also have today with us Nela Porovic, um, who is a feminist activist from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Nela works uh, with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, or as we all know it, um, as WILF, um, where she leads on their feminist political economy work. The main focus of Nela's work is formulation of feminist alternatives to mainstream neoliberal political economy of post-conflict reconstruction and recovery processes. Nella also coordinates WILF's activities in Bosnia and Herzegovina, consolidating uh, Bosnia's uh, conflict and post-conflict experiences so that they can be shared through WILF's feminist networks and through solidarity dialogues with women in similar situations. She is the co-author of the report's concept and framework for development of gender-sensitive reparations for civilian victims of war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and a second report uh, titled A Feminist Perspective on Post-Conflict Reconstructing and Recovery, the Case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. If you haven't had a look on these reports, I strongly recommend them. Thank you for joining us today, Nella. Um, and last but definitely not least, we have uh, Sanja Nikoli, who is joining us from Serbia today. Um, she is a public and private consulting director and uh, is a feminist advocating for women's economic empowerment, gender responsive budgeting, non-discrimination and innovations, uh, innovation as preconditions for full gender equality. She's a member of the civil society advisory group with the UN Women Europe and Central Asia and a member of the regional consultation initiative Future of Equality, she talks. Over the past 20 years, Sanya has been active in the disability movement, especially with regards to user-led service design and political participation of women with disabilities. She's a researcher and, communi and community of practice leader with co-authored over 20 gender analysis, including gender analysis of budget cuts and budget reallocations in response to COVID-19, then gender analysis of government measures in response to the current crisis, and analysis of impact um, of the pandemic on political participation of persons with disabilities. 
Sanya actively supports the PLHIV community advocacy for peer counseling service mainstreaming and is committed to keeping the doors of the women's movement more open for young feminists. Thank you for joining us, Sanya. Um, so before we get started, just a, a couple of housekeeping rules and then we'll dive right in. Um, today's event will last approximately 90 minutes with the first 60 minutes or so, well, after I, I'm done talking, uh, being dedicated to the speakers addressing the core questions around which the webinar has been organized, following by some 30 minutes of Q&A. The audience members will remain muted throughout the webinar, but you have a chance to ask questions in the chat box which I will then convey to our speakers. Please feel free to write your questions as you think of them or at the end during the Q&A, whichever you prefer is fine. Um, I will kindly ask the speakers to mute their microphones when they're not speaking to prevent any interferences. And finally, please note that today's webinar will be recorded. So without further ado, let's get started. I would first like to ask our speakers to reflect on how the COVID-19 pandemic and related responses have affected gender equality in your country or the region. Um, and so let's start in the order in which I introduced you. Let's go with Jenny, then Nella, then Sanya. Um, Jenny, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you again for inviting me in this panel. I'm really, really honored to, to be among these amazing feminists. Um, Actually, I'm going to start a little by uh, giving an overview uh, of the situation of lesbian, transgender and bisexual women as uh, the organization I work with has already uh, has uh, also done a study uh, and I have more uh, more data on, on this issue and then I'll give a broader perspective of the situation of other groups also. Uh, in September uh, 2020, we did a study to see how the situation of LGBTI people and especially transgender, lesbian and bisexual uh, women uh, was during the months of COVID. And it resulted that uh, one in four uh, LGBT women had problems to uh, fulfill basic needs such as food, medication, and uh, access to access to health and housing. Um, we saw from the beginning of uh, of the pandemic, at least the first two months, with, when Albania was closed totally, uh, like we had like uh, people could could not move from home just for one hour, and they need to get permission. That the most vulnerable groups, especially transgender sex workers, really lost all their incomes. They couldn't do uh, sex work anymore and they ended up like without having food for days, like when when they when when they contacted us. And, you know, found in. <coughs> found in this kind of, uh, of reality where uh, also the, the institution were found in a situation where they, they didn't need knew how to how to to react to these needs. Uh, and, you know, at least in countries like Albania, it's not that social services are the best, even in normal conditions. Um, the only uh, the, the only points of reference for the community were uh, LGBTI organizations. So uh, what we decided to do from the beginning was like how to cover these basic needs and how to do the role of the state, you know, of the of the institutions. So what we immediately did was uh, pr um, uh, start and give food packages. Uh, start and give uh, reimbursement money for 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 sheltering for for housing and free medication for people that could not access medication. A huge problem in that uh, moment was access to health, especially for people living with HIV and women living with HIV that were not uh, living in the capital in Tirana because the only clinic we have for HIV. Uh, is is located in the in the capital. So all the other people that needed to access these services had for two months to cut their uh, th their medication. That is very problematic. Uh, and also we had a lot of issues with women that were uh, in methadone therapy that also uh, kind of stopped during this 
these two months and for trans uh, women that needed hormone therapy that also was was a service that was not provided so this uh, these were some of the hugest uh, problematics uh, and then uh, uh, unemployment started to be a huge problem uh, because uh, mostly uh, LBT women face difficulties in finding a job even bef before the pandemic. So after the pandemic, the situation became even worse. According to the questionnaire we did, 50% of, of, of uh, the LGBTI community and LBT women lost their job due to, to the pandemic. The consequences of losing the job was not only reduced financial resources, but also uh, due to the fact that they couldn't cover housing, they had to get back in their families where they were not accepted in many times. So they had to live in abusive families uh, and to go and live back with their perpetrators. Uh, and according to our study, uh, uh, only 7% of the cases of discrimination were reported in the institution. Most of the cases are still very underreported. So this was a huge problem that we identified during the, the, the pandemic. Uh, also, the, the, the other problem with employment was the fact that uh, many, uh, not only LBT women, but many women in general in, in Albania work in, in uh, works without insurances and very badly paid, uh, like women in fasoneries. Do you say in, in English fasoneries that work in these fabrics? Um, uh, many women like working in, in, the, in this sector and in the coal, se coal center uh, sector. Uh, they worked in, in, uh, in very bad conditions where it was very easy to contract COVID. And, and the employers were not like uh, giving them the possibility to work in, in, in safer conditions. So many women got infected in, in, in that period and that's the reality even nowadays actually. Uh, and due to the fact that uh, they are not recorded as employees, like they work in the black market, uh, they couldn't even get the worst, in Albania we call it the worst salary, it's the salary that the government gives you when, uh, uh, during the period that people could not go to work, like during the restrictions. Uh, and this, this kind of uh, measures mostly impacted not only LB LBT women, but general, uh, women in general. Uh, another problem uh, was, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, housing and what we did for the housing, it was not only the rent reimbursement, but also giving the service of the shelter. We have, as you mentioned before, we have opened for many years a shelter now uh that really came to help in this uh, difficult situation and also uh we saw that very important for for passing this uh, these challenges was uh the operating of the souls lgbt that is an online platform and uh do, according to our study it resulted that 20 percent uh of uh, of uh, LBT women during this month suffered from anxiety, from depression. More than 76% suffered from the sense of insecurity about the future, about their financial uh, uh, income, and what was gonna access to education, like what was gonna happen in in the future. Uh, so we saw that the 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 online support was as a good way to outreach not uh, only women living in the capital that have much more access, but also women living in rural, rural areas and in situations with the family where they couldn't speak to phone. For, for example, one of the biggest problem of women that uh, had to go back and live with their families were that they couldn't even talk with their friends on the phone. They couldn't even talk with their girlfriends on the phone. And, you know, at least for communities like ours, like LBT women, uh, friends are a second family, you know, or friends are the main family sometimes. 
and having contact with the uh, with with the friends in these difficult times was was really very very important. Also, um, Je um, Jenny, um, yeah. could we come back? Um, could we come back to you so that yeah we, yeah sure yeah sure. Um, sure. Thank you. I mean, this is very, it's very sobering um, and it, it's also important that you actually have the data on this. Um, you know, whenever we advocate for things, we're always told, oh, you don't have data to back that up, but you actually have it, have the data to to to, to continue lobbying for, for certain services. I'm not sure how much that would ultimately help given that we're always put, all these issues are always put on the back burner. It's all, they always exist in this like, what Cynthia Enlock calls the patriarchal time zone later. It's always later. This is not a priority now. Um, so thank you for highlighting this for us and hopefully this data proves uh, valuable, not not just for the community in, in Albania, but across the region as well. OK, um, Nell, we're ready to hear your um, your initial remarks. Hi, Elena, and thank you so much. And hi to everybody joining us and to my co-panelists. Uh, it's really um, a pleasure to be here, uh, but I do have to say I find this conversation, it's a difficult one uh, because we are, you know, in the midst of the pandemic very much uh, still, and the things are again getting really bad in Bosnia, I guess the third wave, which sort of makes it really difficult to, to talk about the effects. I mean, we can see some of them, but I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, the worst is yet to come, uh, in particularly if we look at the socioeconomic consequences, but also the political ones. Uh, I think, unfortunately, you know, the governments in, in the region, also something they share with too many others, uh, don't really put gender equality, as you were saying in the introduction, high on the agenda in the times of crisis, or maybe, you know, just in general. So, you know, um, historically, we know that it gets worse when it comes to gender equality, right? So speaking from the perspective of Bosnia and Herzegovina, what we also lack is um, good statistics and data on gender equality. I mean, we do have, but I've, uh, during my previous research, always found them not really helpful to fully understand what is going on in terms of gender equality and where women really are. So I think in a way, we lack a proper, from a feminist perspective, not just gender mainstreaming perspective, but from a feminist perspective, we're lacking a proper baseline to know where we were and where we'll we be post-pandemic, if we can imagine a world post-pandemic. Uh, so I think what we do have now uh, is uh, that has been done in the last year's couple of research done by the UN uh, agencies and OEC, and these are uh, sort of qualitative uh, research based on uh, interviews with a number of people. So I think we are still in a period where we can make estimates, but not really any definite conclusions as to where sort of gender equality will land. Uh, and what we can estimate, I think, for, for, for all the reasons that Jenny was mentioning and you were mentioning in the introduction, is that gender equality is um, uh, will get worse. And I think from uh, I want to speak a little bit from the Bosnian perspective. Uh, they will get we know that they will get worse because the outbreak did not happen in a void. Uh, it came sort of riding on uh, 25 years of neoliberal policies as part of post-conflict reconstruction and approaches and the as part of the EU integration process and subsequent destruction of equalities in general. So, you know, to expect uh, in, a, in a situation where the inequality gap is widening to expect the gender equality will be improving uh, in a meaningful way uh, other than in a formal like sense, I think it's just simply not realistic. Uh, and I think in order, you know, to understand what effects the pandemic will have on gender equality in Bosnia, we really have to uh, sort of look at and understand the pre-existing challenges and the structural oppression and how the political economy of post-conflict reconstruction and recovery has upheld and actually still upholds uh, and recreates the oppressive structures. And these are the very same structures sort of that keep pulling women and other marginalized groups down even when uh, seemingly the society is sort of going forward. So, um, I mean, it's been 25 years since the end of the war, right? And, you know, which is quite a lot. It's like one third of a person's life where it should be at least a normal, healthy person. But, you know, it's really not enough when you look at how well Bosnia has been doing um, in terms of post-war recovery and sustainability of the peace, not enough at all. And if we look at some of the unaddressed consequences of the war, we can almost, we could almost foresee, you know, when once the pandemic hit, hit, we could foresee the trajectory of the pandemic and the government's response to it and 
it was always going to end up badly. I mean, there was like no scenario where this would be a rosy picture in, in, in any sense. So, uh, you know, for example, the failure to reconstruct our healthcare system, and I'm not just talking about sort of infrastructural reconstruction, but after the war, uh, what it ultimately led to, to what you were saying in the beginning, women filling the gap left by the state uh, in terms of provision of care. And it also meant that the state and our different administrative units, because Bosnia is so divided over the years, have been doing less and less of providing that care because they're basically relying on the citizens to take care of themselves. And for those, you know, that can afford it, you know, we have the private clinics. And if you can't afford it and you really badly need health care, such as surgery, you know, there's always crowdfunding. I think that's basically how people of Bosnia now uh, support their health uh, healthcare, um, and you know, and the global free market wasn't really slow to catch up. So our doctors and I and I think this is a destiny we share in the region, sort of for now working in Germany and Austria, or, you know, elsewhere. And then came the pandemic. Uh, so you know, you ha we have this destruction and the erosion of the healthcare system that happened during the war. Then the continued destruction uh, through through the neoliberal approach to recovery, where sort of investments in the public sector were with withheld for the benefit of the private investments, you know, created a perfect storm when the pandemic came. And again, we know what happens in these situations. What always happens is that women take over the care burden. And um, I think, you know, when women fill these gaps, this also does not happen in a void. You know, when women uh, stepping in to provide the care instead of the structures that have both an international and national obligation to do so, that means that they effectively uh sort of they they don't have time to actively and equally exercise uh, i guess their citizenship you know their right to participate in public space uh, you know by demanding their rights by taking up employment by you know healing themselves taking times for themselves for whatever they've been through uh in, in case of bosnia there's like the whole history of war then there is the pandemic that space for them shrinks uh, and it was very small to begin with. And just to tell you an anecdote, just the other day for the International Women's Day, I got this, you know, the usual message saying, why are you so angry all the time? You know, women have gotten so much. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to go into the angry stuff. It doesn't matter. But, you know, this idea that women got anything is simply like really, really so wrong because women have fought throughout history for the equality, for whatever equality we have. And then when you have to spend time, you know, picking up the slack from the state uh, and you have to rely on private actors who are ultimately interested in profits, then we really have an issue with sort of equalities or to even maintaining the ones um, we have already gotten over time, to say that in quotes. And just towards the end, also from a Bosnian perspective, I think it's really important for us to look at uh, the utterly, you know, failed governing system and the transition to capitalism as part of our peace agreement. And that, you know, might sound as unrelated to COVID or gender equality, but, you know, as it turns out, it's all part of the same conversation. So this almost unexplainable uh, decentralization of, of the country, which is almost exclusively uh, locally and internationally, I would uh, say, talked about in terms of, uh, you know, it's decentralized so that we can protect civil and political rights of certain ethnonational group, but it's not talked so much about in terms of sort of the system's inherent inability to deliver social and economic rights. So we've had, you know, education, decent work and salaries, health care, uh, housing, decent pensions, uh, you know, something that was like really a need immediately after the war wasn't provided for and turns out is at the core of this pandemic. So, you know, and uh, just uh, and this is my final point is, you know, the very same politics that were pushed from the international actors like uh, IMF or European Union are still being pushed today. So again, the expectation that something different will happen, uh, that we will somehow build back differently while doing more of the same is for me just simply not realistic. So we have a very bad, <laughs> I have a very bad prognosis, so to speak. Mm. Thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you, Nella. Yes, I mean, for me, it's always mind blowing when I see different initiatives about women as peace builders. And yes, I mean, women historically have been peace builders, not all women, of course. Um, 
But then it's almost like there's an assumption that women have healed. Women have, like, there's no need for women to reconcile. They've already reconciled and, you know, let's just move on by getting women again to do more labor. Um, um, but also, I actually quite, uh, I, I enjoy the, the fact, not enjoy, appreciate the fact that you're bringing in um, capitalism or the crisis of capitalism, although that's inheriting capitalism, I would say, um, because I think the separation of COVID from all the other crises that are happening is also quite neoliberal, if you think about it. It means not recognizing the, 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 the vast impact that COVID has had, but also the inequalities that have led to COVID affecting communities so differently, right? Um, but anyways, uh, we'll talk more about this uh, during the discussion. Thank you again, Nella. Sanya, uh, the floor is now yours. Well, in Serbia, pretty much like the, the two um, previous speakers, the situation uh, is similar. Uh, we have also used this crisis uh, to incubate inequalities deeper and to centralize uh, government and get further away from rule of law. So quite handy for some, not for many. Um, the government's response to COVID was rapid. That's a good thing. One month into the pandemic, there was already, um, you know, uh, there were already measures in place. And the economic assistance package in 2020 was worth 5.8 billion euro, which is 12.5% of GDP, so significant assistance. Uh, the good of it is that um, the state was trying to preserve private sector jobs and liquidity, uh, but basically was in, focused on employment. It was doing so by targeting uh, all private sector actors, including the macro and uh, uh, the micro and small enterprises where women really are in the private sector, with assistance of 978 euros over three installments. But there were conditionalities. Uh, enterprises could only lay off 10% of the workforce which for micro enterprises that employ up to nine people meant nobody could be laid off. So they were in a different position and, and women being in this sector really were left without access to other fiscal incentives because they could not fulfill this criterion. So the assistance was gender blind and generally blind <laughs> to the needs as well. We understand that uh, in crisis, when you don't have good data, it's difficult to target and that, you know, the spillover effect is minimal because even those having higher salaries are not really having it easy in a crisis. But a year into the crisis, we still do not have better data. For instance, we do not have data on, on firms uh, by ownership, uh, ownership of firms by sex. Although this is very much in the strategy of uh, the uh, Ministry of Economy. And so uh, there was a universal transfer of 100 euros to all citizens, all adult citizens, which was good because it targeted women in the informal economy, women without access to regular income, uh, women working in the care economy and, you know, unpaid work. So, but that was not really sufficient because 100 euros was welcome at the start of the crisis, but it did not really solve anything later on. Uh, there were no single, not a single measure um, targeting gender equality. And as you all know, crises are great opportunities when the status quo is disrupted anyway to come in with gender transformative measures. So it would have been a nice opportunity that was, of course, missed. But not a single measure, despite women's higher risk of poverty, because women in Serbia who are aged 65 or more are at a 50% higher risk of poverty. And single-headed households are mainly headed by women. 80% of those are headed by women. Uh, women who are inactive on the labor market constitute 56 almost percent compared to 38 percent for men and Roma women um, are also much higher in the unemployment rate in Serbia and women with disabilities 
who constitute 58% of the total of 8% of the population of persons with disabilities in Serbia. So they are overly represented in informal employment. There were no measures to target persons in informal employment. On the contrary, government has decided to work now on a countering grey economy with measures that will make um, part-time employment easier to register, but not easier to pay for by those working in those sectors. So poverty is on the rise, violence is on the rise, reported violence is on the decline, and uh, you know the only allies really are women's groups and civil society organizations who have come forward with some great ideas, but I can talk about that later. But, you know, this is the uh, landscape of Serbia during the COVID crisis. So chaotic, a lot of money, a lot of it borrowed, but really not targeted and no attempt whatsoever to target women and gender equality or other marginal groups. Thank you very much, Tanya. I mean, thank you especially for pointing out the fact that uh, in all across the region, I think in, in Kosovo is somewhere around 70% in Macedonia is 60 something percent, um, the, the percentage of women who are economically inactive uh, or who are considered economically inactive, which is not to say that they're not economically active. They probably work from dawn until dusk um, in taking care of the family or working in a family business or being informally uh, employed. Um, basically performing all sorts of unpaid labor. Um, so I think that's a very important point to, to, to raise. Um, and also the fact that certain groups of women, like Roma women, women with, dis with disabilities, probably LGBTI uh, people as well, are um, overrepresented in, in, in those categories as well. Okay, um, thank you all for, for, for painting the picture, not very brightly, but that is the situation. So thank you for the realistic um, realistic representation of what's happening on the ground. Um, but my second question is a rather hopeful one. Um, and it is whether there are any openings that the crisis, and I speak in, in singular crisis, but I do mean plural crisis, the crisis that comes on top of crisis, um, has created for feminist responses, movements and mobilization. And what might they be? I mean, I think each of you already touched on the role that civil society um, and activist groups have played in, in, in responding to, to the pandemic. Um, so um, what, what, what are some of these examples that, that we can, we can um, think of and discuss further? Uh, now I'll start with Nella and then go to Sanya and then to Jenny so that each of you starts um, the question first. Nella, go ahead. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Well, I think I guess I can start where I finished. My last is this idea and this catchy phrase of because um, I think it's interesting to look at the openings from the, this perspective of this catchy phrase that we've been hearing globally is building back better. I find it really interesting. Um, and I think actually we should be asking ourselves, you know, should we really be building back better or should we building back differently? And I think differently, actually quite a lot differently, uh, exactly the opposite of what we've been doing uh, thus far. And, you know, in, um, and I'll, I'll speak sort of from a Bosnian perspective, but I, I think also many of the things are shared, not only regionally, but I think it sort of reflects globally as well. In Bosnia, obviously, we need super radical changes. Uh, we need a complete transformation of social values and systems, and we will find it very hard, uh, and we will find any openings really hard or anything, the ability to achieve anything really hard with the existing ethno-national uh, elites who actually profited uh, both financially but also politically uh, during the pandemic. And again, we will to, to come back to these neoliberal foundations I was talking about, if we don't get rid of these, we will, you know, it will be very difficult to change. And I think there's another thing that we need to recognize about talking about the opportunities is that in today's Bosnia and Herzegovina, there's basically no real social, political and economic dialogue within which we could embed sort of gender equality or feminist policies. I think that's um, for me, from, 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 from where I'm standing, that's really important because social, political and economic interests of the people living in the country have a long time ago 
stopped being represented in the parliament. So only interests that are being represented uh, and only interests that are visible are those of individuals and groups that gather around same or similar economic and very importantly, ethno-national political and economic interests. So, and I have to also add, unfortunately, the international actors that have been very present in our lives in the country ever since the war are part of this game. So the only people that they truly play with are the ethno-national political elite. The rest is for show, which only, you know, which means in terms of the opportunities that any attempts to advance, you know, feminist ideas or policies, COVID or no COVID, through institutions ends up hitting many walls, locals and international. So, uh, you know, problems in Bosnia have a long time ago stopped being problems only about Bosnia. So the opportunities at this point, I think, are really to be found uh, in the ability of the feminists to take um, to take our political activism outside of the institutions and outside of the framework of donor driven projects. I think that has been uh, really represented throughout these 25 years, the gender equality has basically been one big or several smaller projects, but not a structural sort of transformative movement. And I think also our ability, uh, our opportunity also is sort of dependent on the successes or failures of global and collective feminist efforts to push for concepts and feminist policies in regional, so because the region is very much connected, but also global institutions that sort of uphold the oppressive structures in the country. And I'm here in particularly thinking about the European Union and the international financial institutions that really uh, have a big, big say in our political, social and economic policies. So I don't really know if you know what I'm saying, uh, if I'm talking about the openings, uh, because that sounds very optimistic to my brain, but I think there are old and new concepts, feminist concepts and approaches that could make a huge difference uh, if they would be taken up. And I would like to mention a couple of them. The list is definitely not the final one or exclusive. It's just a couple of them that to me seem very important as we move forward um, and both relevant both locally and globally, right? So one of them, and this obviously, I mean, I, 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 I work with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and for us, demilitarization, disarmament is hugely important. And I think it holds true for Bosnia and for the region as well, for our societies. You know, uh, it's in one of the essential foundations for how we transform our societies. And if we look at the world today, and if we look at the, the available statistics, basically the societies today are highly capable of waging wars, right? But they are not capable of providing care. So collectively, uh, governments around the world invest or spend or waste, however, whichever you know you choose, 1.8 trillion US dollars a year in militarization and securitization instead of investing in social infrastructure, environmental protection, you know, redistributive mechanisms, housing, you know, human rights in general. And so even in Bosnia, you know, who really has an army that really serves only uh, one purpose, which is to provide soldiers for NATO sort of imperialist missions elsewhere, is among top three spending ministries in the country. So it's completely wasted money and not even to talk about money spent on the militarization of the police. And if we look at the the, the most effective response of our government has been to send heavily militarized police to the streets to fight COVID, you know, not to provide more doctors or whatever or Private, uh, no, protective gear, but militarized police. So, you know, the militarization obviously is really important for us from the perspective of peace, but also when we think about the massive amount of money we could, uh, you know, release and instead invest it in social infrastructure. And, you know, obviously, and we talked about it earlier from a feminist perspective, we really need to claim or <laughs> reclaim, if you wish, the central role of social infrastructure, uh, the role it plays in sort of achieving gender equality. And uh, also certainly what we need to sort of be doing is completely transforming capitalist economic system. Uh, you know, we should be measuring the success or failure of our economic system by its ability, our society's ability to sort of guarantee human security and the well-being of the collective, uh, within which then again social uh, investments in social infrastructure would prevail as well as investments, I think, uh, in social and economic policies of solidarity and not just, you know, uh, within a country, but also between countries. Just, you know, the vaccines, they're a perfect example why this, uh, where we should have such a mechanism. And I think, you know, feminist political economy, 
which brings sort of a whole new level of understanding uh, of the economy because it connects the, the the different levels we spoke about, formal and informal, private and public, etc. is really well placed to sort of um, to, to 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 help us create a whole new uh, political economy. And just the final point uh, from a feminist perspective, we spoke about it earlier as well, uh, and for sure we'll continue speaking about it, is care. And I would really like to mention uh, the concept, uh, which I'm sure you, you've probably heard of, uh, is this promiscuous care, which I like very much, uh, which was launched by a care collective in their manifesto of care. And if you haven't looked it up, uh, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, I, I like it very much because it advocates that the issue of care is not just a matter of physical care for someone, but it's basically a broader concept based on a society's capacity to care and uh, nurture everyone and everything. And it's based on this idea of mutual uh, dependence. So that goes beyond the nuclear family where the care is dependent on the woman, you know, and the only people we care about uh, are our people, you know, or our close immediate family or our nation or whatever it might be, you know. And I find this idea of universal care Super interesting from the perspective of the current and parallel crisis going on in our region, which is the crisis of dehumanization of the people on the move of the migrants, uh, because this idea of universal care really helps sort of delete these boundaries, us and them and who is us and who are there and sort of really centers the care around interdependence of people. Um, yeah, so maybe you were looking, for, I'm finishing, but maybe you were looking for something more concrete and I don't know if this is openings or not, but I think um, this particular moment in history, and you've said it in the beginning, you know, for feminists, we've already seen this, but maybe it's a real eye opener for everybody else to see exactly how badly our society is doing and how, you know, ideas that might sound for somebody or might have sounded as super radical, are actually not so radical and maybe if we don't talk about it now we might not be talking about it soon enough thanks thank you Nella. yes i mean my my question precisely came from from the fact that um what i think sanya mentioned uh, earlier from the fact that every crisis creates a possibility for a transformation or for maintain well the status quo is gone so either building worse really or building very differently. Um, so, and, and and I don't mean to, when I ask this question, I don't mean to put even more, you know, ask for even more labor from feminists because this is what, you know, we've always been doing. Um, but I think highlighting some of these ideas that have existed um, and, and how some of the concepts um, and uh, theories and approaches that already exist can help us shed light on the already existing dynamics um, is, is very helpful. Um, Okay, moving to Sanya, what uh, do you have any positive news for us, Sanya? I do. I bring quite a few, I think, very positive examples. But again, I have to put them in the context so it's not uh, interpreted naively as progress. These are just islands of success, but really, you know, suffocated under a lot of what Nella describes as militarization and uh, sort of taking power away from people and institutions. And in Serbia, in particular, there is an ongoing uh, windows dressing uh, when it comes to feminism and gender equality. We're emptying it of content and, and putting women, you know, in visible places under a good light. But that's really not support to any of the feminist ideas, quite on the contrary. Um, having said that, uh, now a new law on gender equality, which is delayed beyond any reasonable extension of deadline, um, is in the making and in a parliament that is really one party parliament. But under different pressures, the word um, around is that there might be a possibility that unpaid care work is included in the economy. That would be a major breakthrough under such weird circumstances. Let's see if that happens indeed. It's supposed to be in parliament around May. So let's see if that comes into effect. Um, feminists, of course, have come up with many, many answers. Groups working uh, on prevention and uh, um, protection of victims of violence have been very active, like elsewhere in the region. But I want to talk specifically about my favorite project, which is Octopus. It is a service that was designed by 
women's uh, initiative from the Kolubara district in Serbia. They work with rural women and I was part of that project as well. Um, we were wondering, you know, how to help rural women who were suddenly during the state of emergency, they were left without transportation. Buses were abolished. They don't own cars. They couldn't go anywhere. They have relatives in other villages surrounded. They take care of children who are going to school online. Oftentimes they do not have access to uh, computers or tablets. So it's very, very difficult, you know, more care work at home, more hygiene work, increased violence, really difficult situation, no socialization, no going to the market, nothing that would really change the dynamic. So we conducted interviews with women and asked them of different ages, you know, what do you miss most? What if you could design a service, what would you like to, to see? And essentially, after the series of interviews and, uh, and the survey, we came up with a very flexible service that consists of the following elements. One is uh, uh, re respite or relax. So it is uh, to give women space where they do not have to, to be functional at home you know, take them outside of the home and uh, give them time for socialization. And they were the ones deciding what kinds of socialization activities they wanted to do. Uh, then we have get trained and they also selected what they wanted to learn about. Uh, there was a distribution of tablets so that their kids could really uh, attend online classes better. But women also were trained in, in the use of those tablets and, and essentially social media, those that did not have access to them. Uh, get mobile, which is uh, women having a car, were giving employment uh, as sort of informal drivers of other women who wanted to go to a nearby city or, you know, another village nearby and they would just trans transport them. Love Yourself, which was a protection of mental health and physical health of women, because this crisis really has depressed many persons, women and men, girls and boys. It has really left them somehow in, in a dark place, I think, and nobody is really paying attention to, to that unless you have access to uh, private health care. And then Support Knowledge, which was um, an activity to support children, school going children uh, in attending schools. And the interesting thing is one of the uh, trainers was uh, studying in the US and she could not leave. She was stuck in that village for a while. But then when she went back to the States, she decided to volunteer one hour a week to her English uh, class students, you know, so now they have Zoom calls with her in the States. And then uh, Empower, which is uh, supporting ideas in the economic sphere, uh, supporting entrepreneurship of women, and Get Together, which is uh, support to uh, women's groups and formation of new initiatives in, in rural areas in Serbia. So it has really, sorry, I do have a dog that responds to other dogs. Um, the response was excellent and we have really created a bit of a stir in, in the villages that were participating. Of course, this was a pilot project that took place over two months, but now this uh, um, association is really doing whatever it can. There are no avenues, regular avenues, you know, to uh, mainstream innovative services. And although our strategy says that, uh, you know, we're counting on innovation in social protection, there's really no way to mainstream them. And even the standardized licensed services are not being provided. Another one that I think is very good by another uh, NGO called Amity is uh, counseling for informal caretakers. They have noted that people, you know, during the state of emergency, you couldn't even go to see your relatives. And they were persons with disabilities who were completely dependent on, on somebody's care. They couldn't go to bed on their own. They couldn't eat or dress or, you know, do the basic uh, errands on their own. And, and this was really traumatic. 
and people were like left alone completely without advice without information so uh, disabled persons organizations have advocated to change that and to allow informal caretakers to you know uh, do their job but uh, there was a massive burnout and they were so concerned you know will i take COVID to the person i'm taking care of what if i can go what if i'm ill and and you know that um, really they burnt out and needed support so they started up this uh, counseling for persons providing informal care and now they have an association and they're also working towards mainstreaming so these are just two examples but so many needs are captured you have feminist organizations all over the country who are aware of the needs but there's just nobody who would listen, and that is truly sad. So we must find a way to get our voices heard, you know, in, in ways that are new or innovative. Thank you very much, Tanya. I think these are... Can, thank you. Um, I think these are very good examples of, um, once again, I think looking, finding openings or finding hopefulness, I guess, um, at the very micro level, because we've seen this, I think, around the globe, that it's been primarily communities, civil society organizations responding to the immediate needs, um, creating a bond of solidarity. And I think this is something that Jenny was already talking about, and um, and I will invite um, her to reflect on this next. Um, but as Jenny was saying, you know, pretty much LGBT, I organizations were the only one recognizing the needs and responding to the needs. Um, but anyways, without going into your remarks, Jenny, could you, um, the floor is now yours to please um, share any examples or, or, or ideas from um, Thanks. your it experience. It was very inspiring to listen to Nela and to Sanya. And I really think I got some good ideas from Sanya also from all the innovative uh, projects in, in Serbia. Actually, I think that what happened and what is happening, it was like a wake up call, uh, not only for people in general, but for organization in, in particular. I think that during these years, many of us has lost a little the touch with the community and with the ground. And this situation made make us think, think about how important it is, you know, to be there for you, your community and, you know, to, 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 to take care of your community, you know, and to be solidar with each other. Like, and I think that at least me personally, that's that's what I learned during this this month. And I think in this regard, uh, I learned that it is very, very important in situation like this to be more intersectional because in our countries we are learn we have been learned with this rhetoric that human rights should be put in a hierarchy. Uh, firstly, we are we are, we uh, we are learned with the rhetoric uh, that derives from our politicians and from the politics that uh, necessities and needs are put in a hierarchy. You know, like and human rights in countries like ours always come at the end of the hierarchy of other needs. You know. And I think this may this should make us uh, realize as NGOs that there is not a hierarchy of human rights. You know, Rama rights are not more important than LGBT rights. Women rights are not more important than other rights. You know, we should all get together in situation like this and fight a system that is much more stronger than us. And it, it has back up from neoliberal policies, for example, and uh, we should think about ideas how to be more innovative, but we should also think that we are very strong because I told, I said to you that our powers is our communities, you know, something that the rest doesn't have. And we should make uh, donors and politicians aware that they shouldn't impose our uh, as their, uh, their their politics, but it should be us imposing to them our needs, uh, our ideas uh, and our own uh, policies, because uh, otherwise we are never going to have, as Nela said, like really big change, you know, and what we need in this moment is to have like a touchable big change and 
like me as a lesbian, I don't want to. I've passed like 35 years of my life being treated as a third uh, hand citizen, you know, and I don't want to live anymore like this, you know, it's 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 our life is is going away, you know, and we still don't don't have the rights uh, that we deserve and women don't have the rights they deserve, you know, and still we are fighting. Uh, uh, and for example, during this 8th of March, we did the protest and we still are having this debate by male saying like, what do women want and what do women request? You know, they have everything that it's such a stupid rhetoric, you know, and still uh, in 2021, men are teaching us how we should do feminism and how we should be feminist and like, yeah, we have enough of this, you know, and it's it's time to really like have big changes in 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 our societies. So that's that's it. Um, thank you, Jenny. Indeed, uh, I mean, here in London, um, in recent days, there's been a case of a young woman disappearing from the streets. Um, and of course, uh, well, not of course, but her being a white British um, woman, um, living in London, this did attract a lot of media attention. It turned out that the person who probably has harmed her, we don't have a, a full um, report on this yet, um, was an actual policeman. Um, and it's interesting because in parallel to that, we have had um, findings from a survey come out that every woman, every young woman in the UK has experienced some form of sexual harassment at some point in their lives. And of course, you know, all the women are now sharing their stories about how when we walk down the streets, we fear of someone of who is walking behind us. There's so many fake calls that we try to make to our friends or, well, actually sometimes real ones as well to ensure that we're safe. And I see all of you are nodding because this is absolutely not news to anyone. But then the advice at the end of it was, um, that women should not walk in dark places or walk by themselves at night. It, the advice was not maybe men should stop raping women, maybe may, men and it's not just men, men, of course, and not all men. Let's not get into that. But maybe we should also focus that response elsewhere. Maybe the problem is not that I cannot walk freely at night, but the person who is actually the source of that uh, prevention of my freedom. Um, so absolutely, I think it's uh, it, it is high time to also stop having these conversations over and over again and move towards a, some a transformative change. Um, so, OK, so now looking forward. This question sounds silly, uh, I realize that, uh, but what do you see as a priority or priorities in creating a more equal post COVID-19 region? And why I think it sounds silly is because this invites you to imagine a post COVID-19 region, which right now feels very far um, in the future with several countries in the region not having received any vaccines, I think, um, or not having a solid strategy of receiving any um, in the foreseeable future. Um, so let's start now with Sanya, then Jenny, then Nela. Uh, and in the meantime, let me just remind the audience um, to please add any questions you might have in the Q&A chat. Hopefully we'll have time to address some of them. Mm -hmm. Sanya. In November, um, something I'm a member of and it's called Women's Platform for the Development of Serbia has had uh, a once in five years strategic meeting and we have come forward with the, our priorities for the future and they're very different from what the mainstream development plans look like. They really focus on eco-feminism, on green economy development, on solidarity, on innovation, on the knowledge economy building, on, you know, um, social services uh, in function of gender equality, access to healthcare for all and so on. We're moving away from that in reality. But if I were to take out one priority, I think definitely would be complete and utter reform of the education system. Although we were fairly rapid in switching to the online mode, that can hardly be called education. It's really sufferance for all of the actors without any guidance for anyone in the system. And I think it's time lost and time is really the most precious resource that people have. And it has again showed the um, symptomatic 
inability of our systems to put users at the center. It really wasn't about children. It was more about how difficult teachers were finding it. And I'm sure they were because they did not receive any guidance. But, you know, a year later, we could still hear in parent uh, meetings that, uh, you know, how the a class will be organized depends on the teacher's skill, as if the school had nothing to do with developing that skill, as if, you know, Zoom based or other platform that is widely used based trainings are so difficult to organize as if learning was not part of the teaching profession. So I think we have got it all wrong. And I think, you know, we have learned a lot. Kids were more natural in, in switching to online mode. But again, that cannot replace human contact and additional efforts needed to be made by the society to ensure that that and um, community based information all information channels have centralized and again you could not hear what happens in your municipality you could not know what shops are open around your home but you would know what happens in belgrade you know or in the central sort of institutions so this is generally i see it as uh, getting real you know be between the state and the citizens i think we have polarized in in so many ways during the pandemic further and more because the protection of public sector employees was much better than the protection of private sector employees. So we do not have the same rights, you know. We cannot talk about, you know, basic income seems like an obvious thing to do. And, and, and so many things seem obvious to me, but I think I would start with education sector reform. Wonderful. Thank you, Sanya. Uh, Jenny, over to you. Uh, I'm going to be short, actually, and I would say that what we need to do and how we need to to uh, react in the future is like be more radical in uh, in in our movements. We have always, you know, we are used to people telling us, you know, be be careful with what you say uh be careful in like building bridges and you know and do this and do that you know i think it's not working that much this kind of uh, uh strategy i think that we need to as as sanya said we need to teach the new generation educate it with more like feminism because at least in countries like ours, when you use the word feminist, people get scared. Women get, girls get scared. Women get scared, you know? We have to talk more about feminism because I think to have a transformative changes in societies like ours, the patriarchal societies, I think that uh, education on feminism is the, the only thing that can bring like a radical, radical change. And uh, I think that the new generation is much open to listen and to learn and to be more active in this regard. That actually, that's my, my, my own experience. Uh, and that's where we should actually start with, with our, our work as, as activists. And I think that, yeah, if we are not taken seriously, if we are used to be not taken seriously, like let's think about some radical things. So people and politicians and people start to take us seriously. Thank you, Jenny. I mean, what what other people consider radical, like it's very basic really, isn't it? Um, I think what, what, this is also very important. Both of you are bring up a very important point because we've seen, especially after the wars, but even the societies that didn't go through wars, um, but during the transition, I hate that word transition, during the transformation of our societies, um, there's been also a repatriarchalization. So even if there were some advancements in terms of gender equality, and I'm not saying that that fundamentally uh, changed the patriarchal relations in the society, in the, in the uh, pre-capitalist uh, transformation. Um, I think a lot of that 
is also gone, right? Both in, as a way of distancing ourselves from the communist past, but also from feminism. Not ourselves, obviously, not us in the call, but um, societies in general. So I think, but that was maybe our generation of people. I think now the young, the younger uh, people are talking about intersectional feminism. They're talking about ideas that might seem radical to us, but are, you know, they're upfront. So absolutely, um, I'm glad that there's a hopeful note there. Um, Nella, um, over to you for your last remarks. Uh, yes, well, no, it was a very interesting discussion. And I think particularly the last point, I think we've been sort of in the last 25 years or more living in sort of a, what a colleague of mine would call also politics of forgetting, because you're absolutely right, Elena, there, there, are, there, are, there have been advancements in gender equality in this region that we have been made to forget. And we're, we live this idea that, you know, we, since the capitalism enlightened us and brought us from the dark into the light, we have now been sort of re rediscovering gender equality, but that's really not the case. We have a long history of uh, women that have uh, really uh, our foremothers, so to speak, that have laid the basis. And I think in, in us moving forward, it's really important not to drop our historical context as well and to learn from it as we adapt and learn new stuff and, and, and sort of more radical ideas. Uh, in terms of sort of, you know, um, post-COVID region priorities, there's so many things I would like to say. I mean, so many things that would be a priority. It's really difficult to say exactly what the priority is because, yes, COVID is a health-related uh, crisis, but like if I look at the, the way Bosnian authorities have responded, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure from what I've been able to follow from the region, the other countries are not that far from, has basically replicated all the political, economic and social problems of this country, you know, right from the corruption to authoritarianism, right down to toxic ethno-national uh, power struggles and ideologies. So, you know, as much as I would love to be in the in a sort of a privileged position to say healthcare is the number one priority, we need to fix it, people need to be healthy. You know, I also want to say that we really need to uh, restore the social dialogue because, as I said, we have been deprived of, uh, and Jenny was talking about, we have been deprived of our voices. We need to reclaim them and how we do it. Well, I guess we'll have to be more fierce than we've been thus far. Uh, I want to say, of course, that the priority is, you know, uh, investing in child and elderly care so it's safe and accessible to all. I mean, I have a six-year-old who goes to daycare and I have an 11-year-old who goes to school and I know really well what it means uh, sort of to do the homeschooling and you know doing the zooms like this and you know feeding the children and all at the same time so we really need that to be accessible we need schools and universities absolutely we need to invest in that we need to invest uh, you know uh, in our and not just in a sense because I, I'm mentioning this not just in terms of sort of online versus not online but our schools and universities have been more and more adapting to the market needs. And if we look historically at how countries have developed, it has not been because the market needs cheap labor, it's because you've invested in technology, you've invested in knowledge in your own sort of pupils and in your students so that they can take the development forward. And I want to see that back uh, or more of that. Uh, obviously, you know, the essential workers, we know all who we have really seen who the essential workers are. Many of them are women decently paid, unionized, protected jobs. I mean, during the crisis, we've seen what ununionized jobs meant for women and men, but also many, many were women in the service sector that was hit hard and the biggest clusters were in the textile industry, etc. So I would like to see uh, better labor protection as a priority. Uh, also, of course, there was already mentioned women that find themselves in the informal economy tend to be not tend to be. They are forgotten. Uh, actually, the measures that are put in place in relation to informal economy is usually some sort of punishment as opposed to understanding that most of the people that find themselves in the informal economy. And I'm not talking about a capitalist elite that refuses to pay taxes. I'm talking about people who cannot afford to make themselves part of a uh, formal economy. So obviously that's a priority as well. Uh, I will stop there, but I think the point I have been trying to make throughout the conversation is, you know, that, um, you know, it didn't happen in a void. It will, the, the solutions will cannot happen outside of the context either. And I think the point is that we can change the context. It's not set in stone. People invented it. We can reinvent it or you know, make, make a new context. 
But I think in order to do that, you really need to bring these different conversations together, gender equality and social justice and demilitarization, care and solidarity, anti-racism. You know, we have to get rid of these colonial legacies <laughs> that we live with, uh, environmental destruction, all of that needs to be brought together. Otherwise, we'll just, you know, um, you know, we will not be having a conversation. How does a fairer post conflict post sorry COVID world looks like? But, you know, whether we are surviving or not, that will be the basis for the conversation. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Nella. No, I mean, that is uh, absolutely in line with uh, Jenny and Sanya were saying as well, that these are uh, for far too long, these conversations have been siloed and we see them, they're siloed now as well. Uh, uh, when, when, we, when, when they speak about COVID, they speak about vaccines, they speak about informing. I mean, I don't know what the case would be in, in, in the Balkans really on this, but we see it in the West that uh, obviously people of color are not too keen on or, or lack trust in the institutions that provide the vaccine for historical reasons. So it's not just about providing more information, but actually tailoring um, to the historical understanding of communities of what vaccination has meant uh, for them and what that can mean moving forward as well. Um, so yeah, again, I mean, I keep going back to this intersectional understanding, but we really do need an intersectional understanding of what the problems are, therefore what the needs are and what the responses should be. I mean, one size fits all, not that there's been any size fit women, but one size fits all also doesn't work. I think that is um, the key here. I don't see any questions from the audience uh, right now. So um, I, I, I want to invite if any of you want to respond to something. I mean, you have sort of been responding already in, in what you were saying, but if you would like to reflect and respond to some of the points raised by the other speakers, um, all of you, I mean, you have, um, and this was basically the idea of bringing you all together. All of you have had uh, different experiences and focus on different um, areas, um, but also importantly, I think each of you has highlighted different groups and the struggles of different groups as well, societally. Um, so I don't know if you have any, I mean, not responses necessarily, but reflections on the, the remarks of the others or addition to, to what's been said. Yeah, Jenny, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll just be very short and I would say that I think uh, discussions like this are very important, not only like to share experiences, but I also think they are very important because like this one and a half year, I felt in a safe environment. I've learned so much from each of you and I think we should have much more open uh, discussions like this and it's a question of sisterhood, you know, and we should also educate the new generation with the idea and the importance of, of, of sisterhoods and to, to have this kind of discussion not only in our countries but also like we have exchanges in the Balkans where we where we have so much common things and you know maybe in the future when things change also to have this kind of discussions face to face and you know get some good energy and some strength from from each other. I yes, want to say Jenny. also Good. that um, I'm intrigued by uh, Jenny's idea of more radical and I, I, I would be willing to explore further that with the other people in this region, what do we precisely mean? I, I see it happening uh, in terms of um, stopping resource, natural resource grabbing that is ongoing. For instance, in Serbia, you have villages where people just won't let go. You know, they don't want to let another uh, small uh, power turbine being, you know, resulting in captivation of a river in tubes or something like that. They, they just don't want, they don't care if it's uh, illegal or if it's violent or if it's, they're just ready for it all. And that generally breeds success. When you're determined to go all the way, then you can succeed. But also we are caught up in, in you know, workload, um, daily life functioning obligations and reality is that sometimes you know feminist initiatives fall flat because there just aren't the numbers you know it's hard for us to organize a march or a protest or a strike so it has to be realistic again not another burden on our time it has to be well thought through and and 
you know, somehow life goes on and we agree on so many things in this region, but then fail to act on it. So I just wanted to flag that, you know, exploring the radical solutions for the Balkans is interesting to me. Thank you, Sanya. And indeed, I mean, uh, you both uh, bring up important issues. I think solidarity across the region has been very important, especially, I mean, civil society organizations and activist, activist movements across the region have been pretty good at doing this even before uh, before the, the, the most recent crisis. But I think in the in the current crisis, this has maybe been highlighted even more. It, again, this might be the siloed uh, little um, uh, uh, echo chamber in which I exist, but um, I have seen a lot of that during the during the pandemic. And and and, and Sanya on the issue of this is what Shireen Rai called depletion. Um, women in general um, uh, have been depleted, uh, and feminists even more so. Um, there's this time poverty that we're facing. Um, by the time, you know, I, I, when I, I was doing part of my research in Bosnia, a lot of women who, are, who would be considered economically inactive, they would say, oh, I don't do anything. But then when you ask them, their day is filled with providing labor that is generally unpaid and they work from 6 a.m. until late in the night. But they would say, you know, I don't do well, I'm translating literally, but I'm not doing anything as in like, I, I don't work. Right. Um, so exactly, when do we have time to also fix the society if we're always busy with care? Um, so I think here um, what Nella was uh, fighting from, I've taken so many notes, so it's very hard to find where this was, uh, promiscuous care and uh, this idea of um, societal and universal care, uh, universal care is very important. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a question uh, from Katarina. As we are talking about regional context, how do we see a cooperation of feminist organizations in the region? What are the options for the improvement? Can it result in some concrete results or is it seen only from the aspect of sisterhood and solidarity? Thank you. And thank you, Katarina. Does anyone want to take that on? It's a big question. I can uh, start, I mean, start the answer. It's not probably the answer. It is a big question. I think it's uh, up to each and every one of us to sort of think how we can develop that further. But as it happens, the way I met Jenny was actually a couple of years ago. Uh, WILP um, in Bosnia was the organization I'm working with, was exploring the idea of uh, how regional feminism sort of networking could look like and how far we could take it and how we could support each other. So we had uh, meetings, but it didn't grow into much. But we did travel around the region um, and sort of talk to feminists. Uh, and one of the things that was striking, striking for me was that there was connections, but it was usually uh, issue based. So LGBTIQ groups had their networks and women organizations working on domestic violence or GBV in general, one network. So there was no sort of um, overarching feminist um, networking and that I mean there are very various reasons for it for example I wouldn't claim that in Bosnia there is a feminist movement I mean some feminists would disagree with me I'm definitely in in sort of uh, my position is that we don't have a feminist movement we have feminist feminists and we have feminists working together but a movement as such does not exist so that can also be it's you know it's it's easier to do e uh, one issue but i think uh, the question was also then you know is there what what i guess option what uh, ability you know ca capacities we do have and what potential there is I think when we look at the region, I mean, we didn't discuss it that much because it wasn't the subject of the conversation, but we are very much still entrenched in the ethno-national and nationalist. And I think maybe it's even getting worse. I'm not sure. I mean, if you look at the Croatia and development, and also I have to bring in this concept of Western Balkans. I really dislike it. I think that's something the European Union has colonized us with this idea that there is a Western Balkans and then there is another Balkan. And you know, soon enough when somebody else and, you know, you, you know, so I, I think it's a pro it's problematic. So but um, we do have issues with him. And I think we as feminists, if we look at the core values of feminism, could sort of go above the nationalist rhetoric and could support each other more than we do when certain issues come. I mean, Bosnia is always sort of looking around uh, you know, on our shoulders to the left and to the right, Croatia and Serbia, what is going on? What sort of issues we will be importing? 
uh, also being seen as the little sister that you know people need to take care of somehow. So I think, I mean, I'm not super uh, concrete in my answer, but I think there is opportunities that we need to explore, but I don't think we have thus far. And as somebody was saying, you know, the, the transformative, the moment to, 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 to sort of change is here. So let's try to do it, but we would need it, I think support each other. Also, I just need to add because, you know, when you look at the uh, Balkans, we are like semi-periphery of European Union or periphery of European Union and semi-periphery of the world. And that sort of brings uh, different conversations to this discussion. So, yeah, I'm um, also sorry. Go ahead. want to thank Katarina for the question. Um, and I really am OK with pluralism also in in uh, feminist movement. And I think it's um, it's a sign of maturity that we we have dispersed in so many directions and we have different priorities, but we do share some of the values that I think connect us still strongly enough to be able to build joint action. And I think in this region compared, for instance, to Latin America and the Caribbean, we have had a particular lack of regional support initiatives. And, and I think everybody has a part in us not being better connected. It would be so easy, people enjoy it. Uh, you know, <clears throat> organizations working on violence against women, they're fairly well connected. Organizations working on some other area are also well connected, but you don't have funding opportunities. You don't have regional organizations. I think a lacking innovation would be to have a regional organization, you know, civil society, because we're so fragmented, I think by design, so that we couldn't get our heads together around the issues. So every time we meet, we just talk about this is what it is like in my country. That is what it is like in your country. And it's the same, you know, like, we could skip the intro, but we don't because we feel like identified and personalized if we have a say. So we have very little time, very little support. We should demand support for regional initiatives because it doesn't make sense. It erodes women's time and we don't have enough time uh, to do everything like seven times. Uh, now, you know, the heated debate Unlike Nella, I'm really a fan of Western Balkans. I think we share a space, we share history, we share, you know, gastronomic sort of, uh, we, we share so much that is unique and separate from the rest of the Balkans, at least in my experience. I'm a big Balkans lover. I have chosen to live in the Balkans, but we can never be given a break to get organized. And I think that is, in my mind, it's not even, it's worth working at the community level and regional level. I think national level is a lost time, really, so. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful question. And I think here we really understand what's the importance of intersectionality. You know, we have been, as I said before, I don't want to repeat it myself, but it's very important. We are, we have been growing up in cultures that have, teach us to be very uh, segregal in our approaches. And like we have always thought that LGBT organizations should only work from LGBT organization, even in a regional aspect, because we have more like uh, uh, things uh, in common and the cause is in common and stuff like that. We have to deconstruct this way of thinking and we have to understand that we can even learn more from organization or from individuals that don't work in our field than sometimes from each other, because sometimes you end up in a vicious circle, you know, talking the same issues, having the same approach and doing the same mistakes and not learning anything new. So that's, I think the, the, the question, the answer is always like being intersectional and maybe think about some, some projects that can be more like regional and can, can uh, enrich all our movements, you know, and get us back together, I don't know. 
Thank you. And I, I mean, again, I want to thank Katarina for asking this question because I think we're ending on a hopeful note. Um, you know, um, Paulo Freire says that hopefulness is a very political act in and of itself. Um, and we do lack hopefulness in our region all too often. Whichever way we call our region, I do see, I do think that Western Balkans rather than Balkans is problematic, but uh, but that's a that's a question for another discussion uh, much longer than this. I want to thank you all, um, each and every one of you for such wonderful, uh, important insights and interventions. You've given us a lot to think through um, and to think about uh, moving forward. I do hope that not just discussions, but actions on base of these discussions um, happen and continue uh, forward in the future. Um, so thank, uh, thank you to the audience who has joined us today. Thank you to the British Council that's provided us with the platform to, to have this conversation. But most of all, thank you Nella, Sanya and Jenny for uh, being just always brilliant um, and inspirational and for joining us today.